Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I've been in the video production business for over a decade now. When I was just a kid, messing around with my dad's old camcorder, I'd make these silly home movies with my siblings, and somehow that childhood passion turned into a career. After film school, I started freelancing, taking any gig I could get my hands on. It wasn't always nice, but I loved every minute of it. One day, I got a call for a job in northern New Jersey. It was for some corporate video shoot, nothing too fancy, but hey, work is work, right? I packed up my gear and headed out, excited for another day behind the camera. The shoot went smoothly. I did my thing, capturing all the footage they needed. Nobody complained or gave me any grief. In fact, I even hit it off with another camera operator there. We chatted during our breaks, and he seemed like a cool guy. Before we parted ways, he handed me his business card. Always good to network in this industry, you know? After the job, I sent my invoice to the company. Standard procedure, nothing out of the ordinary. But a month went by, and I hadn't seen a dime. Now I'm not rolling in cash or anything, so I need to get paid for my work. I figured maybe the invoice got lost in the shuffle, so I sent it again via email. Another week passed, still nothing. At this point, I was getting annoyed. I mean, I did the work, right? I deserve to get paid. So I picked up the phone and called the company directly. I introduced myself as the camera operator from last month's video shoot and asked about my unpaid invoice. The company representative told me, they had decided not to pay me for the job. Shocked, I asked why. They said I didn't do a very good job. I was floored. Where did this come from? Nobody said a word to me during the shoot. If there was a problem, why didn't they speak up then? I tried to explain that this wasn't acceptable, that I had done the work as requested, and there were no complaints on the day of the shoot. But the representative just said their decision was final and rudely ended the call. I was fuming. Who did these people think they were? I paced around my apartment, trying to figure out what to do next. Then I remembered the other camera operator I'd met. I dug out his card and gave him a call. I greeted him and explained my situation, asking if he had any trouble getting paid. He confirmed that they had tried the same trick with him, claiming he didn't do a good job. When I asked what he did about it, he told me he got a lawyer friend to write up a letter on fancy letterhead. He sent it to them, and suddenly they found his invoice. I was surprised it worked, and he explained that these corporate types usually back down when they think you might actually take them to court. I thanked him for the advice and got to work. I didn't have a lawyer friend, but I did have access to the internet. I drafted up an official-looking letter, threw in some legal jargon I found online, and sent it off to the company. Lo and behold, a week later, I got my check in the mail. It was ridiculous that I had to go to such lengths, but at least I got paid. Fast forward a couple of years. I'm sitting at home editing some footage when my phone rings. I don't recognize the number, but I answer anyway. Big mistake. A man's voice asked if I was a camera operator, saying they were planning a shoot next week and wanted to discuss logistics. The voice sounded vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place it. I could hear other voices in the background. Clearly, I was on speakerphone. I confirmed it was me and asked who was calling. The man identified himself as the owner of the company I had worked with a couple of years ago on a corporate video. Suddenly, it all came flooding back. The unpaid invoice, the rude dismissal, the letter I had to send. My blood started to boil. I interrupted him, reminding him that his company had refused to pay me for a job I did, forcing me to threaten legal action just to get my money. I asked how he had the audacity to call me for another job. There was an awkward silence on the other end. I could almost feel the tension through the phone. The company owner stammered, trying to claim it was a misunderstanding. I told him it wasn't a misunderstanding, but unprofessional and insulting. I made it clear that I don't work with people who don't respect my time or my work and told him never to contact me again. And with that, I hung up. I sat there for a moment feeling incredibly satisfied. I hoped everyone in that room heard what I said. I hoped they all realized what a jerk their boss was.
It begins because I forgot to eat breakfast. I was running late for school and in my rush, I grabbed a granola bar to eat on the way. I thought I'd have time to finish it before class, but as soon as I walked into the classroom, my teacher spotted it. The teacher's face turned red as she screeched at me, demanding to know what I thought I was doing and reminding me that no food was allowed in her classroom. I tried to explain that I hadn't had time for breakfast and offered to put it away, but she wasn't having it. She demanded I hand over the granola bar immediately. I reluctantly gave her my granola bar, thinking that would be the end of it. The teacher then declared that I was going to learn a lesson about following rules. Confused, I asked her what she meant. Her response was simply to tell me to follow her. She grabbed my arm and dragged me out of the classroom. I was confused and scared, not knowing what was happening. We stopped in front of the janitor's closet and my heart sank. I pleaded with her not to put me in there, explaining that I was claustrophobic and couldn't handle small spaces. The teacher dismissed my concerns, calling me dramatic and insisting it was just a closet. She told me I'd stay in there until I learned to respect the rules. I begged her again, trying to make her understand that I was serious and that I couldn't breathe in small spaces. But she didn't listen. She shoved me into the closet and locked the door. The darkness closed in around me, and I felt like the walls were closing in. I couldn't breathe. I started pounding on the door, screaming for help. I cried out, begging to be let out, saying I couldn't breathe and calling for help. I don't know how long I was in there. It felt like hours. My throat was raw from screaming and my hands hurt from pounding on the door. I could hear muffled voices outside, but no one came to help. The panic was overwhelming. I felt like I was dying. The next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. My parents were there looking worried and angry. They told me what happened, how some of my classmates had gone to the principal, how he'd found me unconscious in the closet how they'd rushed me to the emergency room. I was okay physically, but mentally, I was a mess. I couldn't sleep without nightmares, couldn't go into small rooms without panicking. My parents were furious. In our country, people often take justice into their own hands when the system fails them. And that's exactly what my father did. I didn't know the details at first, but word spread quickly in our small town. The teacher's car was found burned to a crisp one night. A few days later, she was attacked by a group of women outside her house. She ended up in the hospital with cuts and bruises. The school board finally took action. They suspended her, then fired her. She lost her teaching license. Last I heard, she and her husband had moved away to the suburbs, probably to escape the shame and the whispers that followed her everywhere in our town. I thought that if sharing my story, can help prevent something like this from happening to someone else, then maybe some good can come out of this nightmare after all. I was a young, ambitious guy working for the government. Fresh out of college, I landed a job that most of my peers would kill for. Good salary, great benefits, and a sense of purpose. That's where I met her. She was beautiful, smart, and had this infectious laugh that could light up a room. We hit it off immediately. Our romance led to marriage within a year. At first, everything was perfect. We bought a house, took fancy vacations, and lived the kind of life you see in those cheesy rom-coms. But as time went on, I started noticing little things about her that didn't sit right with me. It all came to a head when I decided to join my employer's charity program. It was simple enough. You could choose to donate a portion of your salary to various charities. I picked a few causes close to my heart and set up a monthly donation of $50. When my wife found out, she completely lost it. I'll never forget that night. I casually mentioned signing up for the charity program at work, thinking it was no big deal. Her reaction caught me off guard. She questioned my decision, clearly upset. I tried to explain that it was just a small monthly donation to different charities, thinking it was a nice way to give back, but she didn't see it that way at all. She accused me of being out of my mind, arguing that we worked hard for our money and shouldn't be giving it away. When I pointed out it was only $50 a month and we could afford it, she exploded. She yelled about how many shoes she could buy with that money instead. Things escalated quickly from there. She started throwing things, screaming at the top of her lungs. And then, to my horror, 
She grabbed a knife from the kitchen. She threatened me, demanding that I cancel the donation immediately or be ready for what's coming. I was stunned. This wasn't the woman I married. Over the next few years, our relationship deteriorated. Every little disagreement turned into a full-blown argument. She became more controlling, more obsessed with material things. It was like living with a stranger. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I filed for divorce. And let me tell you, it was ugly. She fought tooth and nail for every penny, every possession. By the time it was over, I felt like I'd been through a war. After the dust settled, I found myself in a new job at a non-profit. The pay was significantly less, but I was happier than I'd been in years. That's when I had an idea. A petty, childish idea. But one that brought me more joy than I cared to admit. I started donating to charities again, but this time I used her email address for the tax receipts. Every month, she'd get a nice little thank you note for her generous donation to causes I knew she'd hate. Wikipedia was a personal favorite. She always ranted about how information should be paid for. One day, I got a furious email from her. She demanded to know what I thought I was doing and told me to stop using her email for my donations. I feigned innocence, saying I thought she'd appreciate the tax deductions. She angrily pointed out that she couldn't even use them since she was now in the US, and these were all Canadian charities. I pretended to have forgotten about that, apologizing for my mistake. Now, I'm not saying what I did was right. It was petty and immature. But every time I get a notification that a donation has been made to help sick kids, or fund cancer research, or support the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, I think about how much good that money is doing. And if it happens to annoy my ex-wife in the process, well, that's just a bonus. Some people might say I should let go of the past move on with my life. And most days, I do. But those little email notifications, they're my way of reminding myself that no matter how dark things got, I never lost my desire to help others. And that's something she can never take away from me. Ever since I was a kid, I loved staying active. As I grew older, that passion turned into a daily gym routine. For the past five years, I've been going to the same local gym. It's nothing fancy, but it's got all the equipment I need and a great community of regulars. Everything was going great until last month when this new guy showed up. At first, he seemed like any other gym member. On a Monday morning, I was in the middle of my usual chest workout when I heard a shrill whistle. I looked up confused and saw this guy strutting around like he owned the place. He had a clipboard in one hand, a whistle around his neck. And get this! Two burly dudes following him around like personal bodyguards. He marched up to me and told me I was on his bench press and that it wasn't my scheduled time. I was so shocked I couldn't even respond at first. When I finally found my voice, I asked him what he meant. He explained that the equipment was now his and that he had created a schedule for optimal use of the gym. He informed me that I wasn't on the schedule for this time slot. I responded by telling him that this was a public gym and we didn't have personal schedules for equipment. He insisted that we did now, saying he had taken it upon himself to organize what he called chaos. He then demanded that I vacate his bench press or receive a ticket. I thought he was joking, but then he pulled out this ridiculous looking pad of mock tickets and started scribbling on it. I told him this was absurd and that I wasn't going anywhere. He responded by saying fine and handed me a ticket, warning me that three of these would result in me being out of the gym. He slapped the paper on my chest and moved on to harass someone else. I was too stunned to do anything but stare at the ticket in my hand. Over the next few days, things only got worse. This guy, let's call him Mr. Entitled, started showing up every day with his clipboard, whistle, and security team. He'd march around the gym blowing his whistle at anyone using his equipment outside of his so-called schedule. One day, he brought in this personal trainer who followed people around, criticizing their form and yelling that they were doing it wrong. It was like living in a fitness nightmare. I tried talking to the gym staff, but they seemed just as bewildered as the rest of us. They said they were looking into the situation but didn't do much else. Things came to a head about two weeks into this madness. I was on the treadmill when Mr. Entitled's trainer came up to me. 
He criticized my running form, telling me it was atrocious and that I was wasting energy and risking injury. I told him I didn't ask for his opinion and asked him to leave me alone. The trainer insisted he was just trying to help, explaining that Mr. Entitled had graciously provided his services for free. I responded by saying I didn't want his help or Mr. Entitled services and that this was harassment. Mr. Entitled, hearing our exchange, came storming over. He accused me of refusing professional help, claiming it was a violation of gym policy and threatening to write me up. I protested, saying there was no such policy and that he couldn't just make up rules. He insisted that he could and would, stating that the gym needed structure and he was providing it. At this point, I'd had enough. I stepped off the treadmill and marched straight to the gym manager's office. I told him everything that had been happening and demanded action. To my relief, the manager seemed to finally grasp the severity of the situation. He called Mr. Entitled into his office, and I waited outside hoping this nightmare would finally end. But then I heard shouting from inside the office. The door burst open, and Mr. Entitled stormed out, phone in hand. He shouted that we'd be hearing from his lawyer, claiming this was a violation of his fitness freedom. Fitness freedom? Was that even a thing? The next day, the gym was eerily quiet. Mr. Entitled wasn't there, but neither were many of the regular members. People were afraid to come back. But then something amazing happened. The gym manager called a meeting for all members. He apologized for not acting sooner and explained that they had been gathering evidence of Mr. Entitled's behavior. He announced that they had permanently revoked Mr. Entitled's membership and were pursuing legal action for harassment. He assured us that the gym was a safe space for everyone. There was a collective sigh of relief in the room, but the manager wasn't done. He then told us that to make up for this ordeal, they were offering a free month of membership to everyone, and they were bringing in actual professional trainers for free sessions. The gym erupted in cheers. As we were leaving, I overheard someone say they'd seen Mr. Entitled outside, served with a restraining order preventing him from coming within 100 feet of the gym. Over the next few weeks, the gym atmosphere returned to normal. People were smiling again, helping each other out, and enjoying their workouts. Mr. Entitled's fitness freedom lawsuit was thrown out of court, and he became a local laughingstock. Sometimes it takes a community coming together to shut down someone who thinks they're above the rules. And now every time I hear a whistle, I can't help but chuckle, remembering the time we all defeated the self-proclaimed Jim King. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.